afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Again, thank you all for joining us this year at the Legislative uh, Session Summit here. Uh, my name is Reverend Dr. Alicia Simmons. I'm the Eastern Regional Associate Director with the program called Partners in Health and Wholeness. So that's one of the initiatives of the North Carolina Council of Churches. So it's likely you've heard of our program or we've worked with you in some capacity. So today's session has a hard stop of 150. So we know that you have um, interest and questions and all those things, but at 150, we're going to transition out of here. So right. let's get started, okay? Let's a get a uh, hard stop. <laughs> yeah, all right. Um, today's speaker, we are excited to have him, is Mr. Bob Phillips from Common Cause, North Carolina. And so uh, Bob Phillips has served as Executive Director of Common Cause, North Carolina since 2001. Bob's work includes lobbying the legislature and building statewide grassroots campaigns for good government reforms. He is a North Carolina native. He's a graduate of UNC Chapel Hill. Won't hold anything against him as a Ducrat. <laughs> and <laughs> is a broadcast Carolina. journalist in Raleigh and press secretary for the former Lieutenant Governor Dennis Wicker before joining Common Cause. The description of the workshop. In this workshop, we will explore the current state of voting rights in North Carolina and the legislation being discussed at the North Carolina General Assembly that in could impact those rights. We will dive into the current debate surrounding early voting access and restrictions on mail-in voting. And we will discuss recent North Carolina Supreme Court rulings impacting the rights of voters and the implications that come with it. Participants will learn about the potential consequences of these changes, including the impact on marginalized communities and the potential for voter suppression. So take it away, Mr. Phillips. All right, thank you so much for a great introduction. And uh, in the interest of time, we will not take attendance here. Uh, but I am interested, well, and I do want to say hello to uh, my old friend George Reed, because when I started at Common Cause 24 years ago, you were one of the early people that I would come to and say, you know, what am I doing here? What, what, what are we trying to do? But I, I use that to say that Common Cause and the NC Council of Churches have been allies all these many years, and we're all about the fight for a more equitable, multiracial, just democracy. And it's a challenge right now, unfortunately. I know. When we think about those old days, I mean, it was a little bit easier pre-2010. I try to say that with a nonpartisan hat on. But uh, it's a pleasure to be here with you. Yes, I am a UNC Chapel Hill grad, and I know that we have this little rivalry going <laughs> back and forth here. Uh, another little note here, the next speaker that everybody wants to come to see he and I are the same age. I'm actually a day older than the governor. Uh, I knew him in Carolina. We were there at the same time. He's done a lot better than I have. Obviously. But, uh, I've had a lot of good um, and I've, I mean, again, I'm saying this in a nonpartisan voice. As was mentioned, I worked for Lieutenant Governor Dennis Wicker back in the 90s. You all may remember he was a lieutenant governor when the governor for our lives, His Excellency Jim Hunt was, you know, uh, operating. Yes, I, I remember it. Um, loved Jim Hunt. Me and, too. Uh, Governor Cooper was at the time a House rep and a state senator, and I did get to know him well. And uh, he and I have had some wonderful conversations about just what today what we're talking about, and that's voting rights and how we can protect them in this climate that we're in. Uh, just so you know, and again, I think you, there's a familiarity probably with many of you all, but uh, Common Cause, we are in our 50th year. We're one of those old line good government groups. We work well with not only the NC Council of Churches, but the League of Women Voters, NAACP, Democracy North Carolina. I see heads nodding. You all know who these wonderful groups are. We're all a team. We're all a coalition. And we've all been in this fight for at least as long as I've been at it. Um, and a couple of things I want to say kind of to you know get the context of where we are today. When I took my job with Common Cause, Back in 2001, North Carolina had one of the poorest voting turnouts of any state. We were in the bottom 10. And in those days, let's see, Governor Easley, uh, again, I'm going to be careful. I want to keep my nonpartisan hat on. But there was a Democratic-controlled legislature that we were able to work with a little bit easier than certainly we can now with the current majority party. And we got a lot of good things passed. Some of the things you may remember was expanding the early voting period. Mm -hmm. We now have a mm -hmm. 
17-day early voting period, we were able to pass same-day voter registration, which is a terrific tool for mm -hmm. folks when they come in, particularly college kids. We have 900,000, I think of what I was reading, uh, students who go to our publics and private universities, and many of these kids, young people, they use this tool of same-day voter registration uh, to be able to uh, you know, simultaneously register and vote. We had pre-registration of 16 and 17 year olds, also the right to be able to cast a provisional ballot that would um, count if you showed up on election day at the wrong precinct. Um, and of course, in those years, we were able to fend off uh, that thing that passed in 2018 in the referendum, uh, voter ID. So uh, I mention these things because, again, I'm a big context person. You all may remember when the power flipped in 2010, and then we had something called the Monster Election Law Bill. Has anyone ever heard that? It was a term that uh, maybe another person I'll mention, Bob Hall, if you all have ever heard of him, the legendary founder of Democracy in North Carolina. Mm -hmm. House Bill 589 was this bill that started out as a 10-page little bill on voter ID, and then it swelled into a 60-page mega monster bill that did everything. It repealed all these great things I've just mentioned. Uh, some of you all may remember we were the first state in America to offer full public financing for our judicial candidates. Uh, that means our judicial candidates, appellate court candidates, state court of appeals and state supreme court worked wonderfully well pre-Citizens United. That was repealed, so a lot of bad things happened uh, when House Bill 589 was passed. We were some of the litigants along with the NAACP and League of Women Voters that went to court, successfully turned back, reversed some of those court decisions. And in the last decade, 2010 to 20, well, to, to now, I should say, uh, we've been playing defense, and that is doing everything we can to protect voting rights. Another issue you may know about that we work on is fair maps, ending gerrymandering. We were the mm -hmm. group that took uh, one of the cases went all the way to the U.S. Supreme Court, where we lost. Uh, another case we won in state court in 2018. We were also part of the latest um, challenge where we were also successful at uh, overturning the maps that the lawmakers had drawn, the ger extreme partisan gerrymandered maps. And uh, of course, as you, may as you all may know, two or three weeks ago, uh, state Supreme Court reversed that. Yeah. And they also reversed the, uh, the ruling that had stopped the enabling legislation, that is the implementation of the voter ID, exactly. which uh, means kind of now it's a path to kind of move forward yes. on all that. Now, I am going to get to what's happening now, but again, I like to provide the context. So I'm hoping um, I don't see any eyes glazed over yet. I have put audiences to sleep. Uh, as Peter, another one of uh, my friends who, when I joined Common Cause, you were on the board. And then you left right after that. I don't know if it was there. Was there was no. <laughs> you were done. There was no you relationship. The right okay, uh, you're very kind to say that. Um, so where we are at the moment, and this is important for everybody to really understand too, the 2022 election. And again, I'm saying this with a nonpartisan hat on. Uh, we know one party did a lot better than another party, and it sort of was different from what happened around the country. You know, the so-called red tide that many states, it didn't really happen and materialized. It wasn't a wipeout red tide, but it was, you know, a bit of a tide here. I say that because here's the thing a lot of people don't realize. In the November election in 2022, we had the best voting rights laws we've ever had in North Carolina, in my opinion. They were all good. Everything I've mentioned was in place. No problem with voter suppression. If anybody tells you that, and I'm saying this, as the advocate for voting rights, but it was all good. Could have been better, there's some things we are always mm -hmm. trying to improve, but there was nothing really wrong with our voting laws in the November 2022 election. Another thing too, I know it's not what I'm talking about, but fair maps, they were not as gerrymandered as we've seen. Remember that court case where the court did say, these are extreme mm -hmm. partisan gerrymanders, mm -hmm. and they were. The November 2021 maps that the lawmakers adopted mm -hmm. would have produced a congressional map 
that would have been probably for sure 10 to 4, but maybe 11 to 3. Strategically. And exactly, it's, that's what gerrymandering is. And of course, we all know that the remedial map, the fancy word of saying that where they had to redraw the new map yeah. that the court ordered, and in this case, it was a, what they call special masters that drew the map. That was a 7 7 split. You know, for North Carolina, you know, maybe we're not as deep purple as we once thought we were, but we're still a 50 50 state in many ways. That's about as good as you want it to be. Yeah. It's really a good map. Um, voter turnout was bad, you know, and there's a lot of people opining about why we're trying to figure it out, and we're also trying to do everything we can to improve voter turnout, get out the vote. And again, I say that with a nonpartisan voice. We produce, with our friends at Democracy North Carolina, the largest nonpartisan uh, voter guide in the state, and we'll be doing it again this year and in the 2024 election. It's important for us that we have good voting rights laws on the books. Now, all that context, where are we today? As you all know, November 2022 election was a good year for the majority party. They have super majorities in the one chamber, and then because of a legislature in Mecklenburg County flipping, they mathematically have the super majority in the other chamber. Although for all practical purposes, I think they had, as Speaker Tim Moore says, a working super majority as it was. There were a handful of Democrats that seemed to be going with them on a lot of these important votes. There's a real fear now. All these great voting laws that we've had in North Carolina, some of, in, in some instances, we've been a leader in the South and in the country. We were the largest state in America when we adopted same-day voter registration. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and I meant to tell you too, that little factoid about how when I came to Common Cause, we were in the bottom you know, um, 10 in terms of voter turnout. Uh, in the 2008 election, the historic election of Barack Obama, we shot up to the top 10 in voter turnout and generally have been there. We flipped it. Uh, we'd like to think that some of those great voting laws that we talked about uh, expanding the um, early voting, same-day voter registration, um, being able to cast that ballot. Um, see another friend back in the room here. Uh, anyway, it's great to see a lot of familiar faces here. Um, we like to think that that has something and had something to do with the improved voter turnout in our state. Now it's all threatened. <clears throat> it is being attacked, our voting rights are under assault. There are legislative proposals in the hopper, if you will, most of them coming from the House, that would uh, do a few things. And again, some of this you may have already heard. It would cut our early voting, 17-day early voting period, in half, more than half, mm -hmm. um, maybe eight days. They want to cut out Sunday voting. Mm -hmm. You know, that's part of it. Mm -hmm. Souls to the polls, a big mm -hmm. program that mm -hmm. gets people voting. That's well, they want to eliminate at least one of the Sundays, maybe two, if at all possible. Um, there's also the same day voter registration, where mechanically they would marry it to provisional ballots. It's kind of a way I'll say I won't get into the weeds of it, but dismantling same day voter registration, which was a, a problem. They have a proposal that would put in more of these partisan uh, poll observers. Maybe many of us don't realize, but it is uh, allowed where you have the parties can put in observers, but they have a place they have to be that cannot be disrupted. This proposal would literally give more, uh, let these folks roam around in uh, the precinct. So imagine this, you're voting. Mm -hmm. And you've got your, you know, I don't know, how, how many folks are from Wake County? Or how, are many of you all from Wake County? And then some of you all are from other places. But in Wake County, we have the, you know, the paper ballot, and you stick it in the machine. I think most of us are going to that, actually. But um, imagine if somebody's kind of around your shoulder, you know, and you don't know who they are, and you think, well, are they looking at, you know, my ballot? That's the fear. And I think, again, the rationale behind some of this is that, uh, intimidation, you know, plain and right. simple. People want to put these partisan poll observers in the precincts. That's one of the proposals. Um, we worry about college student uh, voting. Has anyone ever heard of Cleta Mitchell? Does that name sound familiar? Have you all seen how she's made the news in the last week or two? Cleta Mitchell, by the way, for people who may not know her, remember that wacky phone call when former President Donald Trump was calling Georgia 
and the Secretary of State, I think his name is Brad Rattlesberger, and he mm -hmm. said, find me whatever many yeah, rooms it was. Yeah. Right. Remember that call? Yeah. There was a female voice on that call, Trump's lawyer, her name is Cleta Mitchell. Oh, yeah. Jesus. She lives in Southern Pines, North Carolina, too. You know, so she's here with us uh, in our state. She's. <laughs> I will not disagree with that. Okay. Um, I, maybe I won't say it, but I will not disagree with it. Um, she was caught on tape a few weeks ago at a big donor retreat in Nashville, Tennessee, basically saying, we got to stop these college kids from being able to vote. They have no right to vote. They just roll out of bed, cast a ballot, and then come back to bed. We've got to stop that. And she wants to cut out early voting. She wants to completely cut out same-day voter registration. On tape, the Washington Post and the New York Times both did a story on this. She's quoted as saying, and we're really getting, you know, we're making headway in North Carolina. Even mentioning the legislator who flipped. Anybody from Charlotte, by the way? Anybody from Iowa down? Uh -huh. we, we're from Concord, but close enough. Concord, Cabarrus County. Yeah, yeah. We, yeah. Uh, I hail from the great state of Mecklenburg, but I've been here for 40 years, so okay. Raleigh Durham is my home. Trish Cotham is the you know representative yeah, who flipped. Yeah, know. Um, mentioning even her, it's like, yeah, we, we, we can get all this done. That's a real fear, and I will tell it you, I, I, I came back today from where the sausage is made, the legislature. One of the hats I wear is lobbying the North Carolina General Assembly. Thus, this this sign, this uh, little badge here I have to wear when I go there. And uh, I saw not Cleta, but I saw people who were working for her. Mm -hmm. I was attending the election law committee meeting as I do. And they were right in there. They are pushing this mm -hmm. narrative that young people in college should not vote. That we should eliminate early voting that we should um, just make voting harder. That's what it is all about. That's the whole thing. And, um, you know, we're trying to, as a lobbyist, I'm trying to find out right now, how serious is this? Is the leadership listening to this? Or are these, you know, just kind of fringe folks and they're, you know, kind of getting a little bit of lip service? But unfortunately, um, they're in what we call the building quite a bit. They're in the legislature and they're trying to, you know, have their way lobbying just as I do. So uh, when I see this guy, I note that he's in there. So what's going to happen and where are all these things? And this gets a little bit into the legislative weeds a little bit. So bills have been filed. <clears throat> and <clears throat> in one committee, the same day voter registration was heard. And I think it's maybe in rules or maybe it's still in the election law committee, but it hasn't really moved. And there's a lot of things happening at the General Assembly right now. Uh, but it's there on maybe the middle burner. It's not on the back burner, not on the front burner. But we're trying to find out what's going to happen. Are they going to move these bills <clears throat> out of committee? And we're doing our research. And uh, the interesting thing is early voting, same day voter registration, and the, and the one thing I didn't mention either is, you know, I don't know if anybody voted an absentee ballot in 2020 particularly. Uh, we have in North Carolina what's called a three-day grace period, and that is if your absentee ballot is postmarked on the election date properly mm -hmm. and arrives within those three days after the election, sealed, postmarked, it will still count. Mm -hmm. Many states have it. That bill was passed sometime in the um, aughts with bipartisan support. Moore and Berger actually voted for the bill. Now they want to cut that out. Uh, they want to eliminate the grace period we have for absentee ballots. And um, <clears throat> all these are in the House. We think we can make the case to the majority party, why are you doing this? Why would you want to cut things that are benefiting mm -hmm. like your voters? Work. That's right. Why would they do that? Even same-day voter registration, give you an example, in 2008, Barack Obama and that campaign he ran in North Carolina, they used that like we've never seen. It was a brand new law. They encouraged lots of people to use it. And in 2008, <clears throat> you had Democrats using same-day voter registration at twice the level of Republicans. Fast forward to 2020, you know what? Republicans use same-day slightly more than Democrats. It shows you, I mean, it's a good law. Mm -hmm. Every party can benefit from it if they just utilize it. So we're trying to make that case to Republicans, but we don't know really where they're going to go with all this stuff. As you all may know, this is the year that uh, what they call the long session and the primary business of the legislature is to formulate a budget and pass it. And the House has passed its budget already. The Senate has trotted out its budget yesterday. 
what will happen is they disagree. You know, the budgets are not in alignment. And when that happens with any piece of legislation, you have then what's called a conference committee. Conferees are uh, appointed. These are members of the chambers. And they all get together and they iron out a budget agreement. Um, <clears throat> Republicans control the game because, you know, they have the majority party. They'll put a few Democrats in this so-called conference committee. There's not a lot of transparency. You know, we don't know when they meet. They meet ad hoc meetings, uh, a lot of behind closed doors, but big decisions are decided in the budget. And you know what? It's not all about the numbers, the finances. That's where they dump things into that budget that have nothing to do with the balancing the state or the finances, but everything to do with policies that they want. And the fear is that these bad anti-voting, anti-democracy bills that are all out there could be dumped into a budget. The budget is tied to Medicaid expansion, and I know the NC Council of Churches and everybody in this room has been advocating for that. And so what is the governor, the speaker, whom we're going to hear, what's he going to do? You know, I mean, my gosh, do you actually veto that? And I'll say this too, it's an up-down when you have this mm -hmm. conference committee budget agreement, both chambers, and they just rubber stamp it, it's up down, no amendments, nothing. Mm -hmm. wow. So <clears throat> we're doing everything we can do. Uh, if anybody is from a Cabarrus County, mm -hmm. Senator Paul Newton, I want to talk to you after this is over. Okay, I'm, sure. I'm gonna be here I'm gonna be here <laughs> past Cooper. So I will say this as a lobbyist if you're from a county where majority party members uh, are living, um, maybe I should just give you my right. email address and then mm -hmm. please contact me. And uh, my email address is B Phillips. Um, I wish I had enough cards here because they're not going to go around, but it's B Phillips at commoncause.org. B Phillips at commoncause.org. I see somebody with a hand out here. I've got a few cards here, but. Take a picture and pass it. Uh, yeah, take a picture and pass it. Yeah, Great yeah. idea. That's right. Um, okay, yeah, yeah somebody. Um, seriously, you know, your voice, the citizen's voice is more powerful than mine. They know who I am. They know what I stand for and what I'm about. And they're, you know, I've been around doing this long enough. Um, yeah, well, maybe I'll just, you know, why don't we do this? Why don't we pass these around and everybody can write them down and distribute and all that. I'm serious. People power is what John Gardner, the founder of Common Cause, it was, well, that's what it was all about. And uh, we'll take anybody and everybody who can help us connect with the majority party to say, don't do this. Your party benefits, your voters benefit. Independent voters are using everything that we're talking about as well. Thank you. So, voter ID, that's a little bit of a separate category. Mm -hmm. What are they going to do? Uh, the Paul Newby court, as I call it, you know, reverse. The enabling legislation is um, now Technically, what they passed, this Senate Bill 824 a few years ago, technically is the law. And for some of the people who really follow this stuff, there's a federal litigation, but there's no injunction with it. It's not going to stop lawmakers doing what they want to do. And they want to make no mistake about it. They want to get the voter ID on the books, probably for the municipal elections, and for sure, for sure, the 2024 election. So how harsh is it going to be? You know, how much is Cleta Mitchell influence going to play into all this? We don't know, and that's a question we're trying to ask a lot of people. Uh, you know, what what's going on with that? Um, sure. I'll, what's yeah. happening with formerly incarcerated people in voting right now? Well, that was another bill. That was you know another bill. That was another law that was reversed, and what we had was now. I mean, what was if you were a felon, you were out of jail, you had your right to cast a ballot mm -hmm. back. That was the big win. Um, CSI used to know, I can't remember now what the acronym is for, but they won. Newbie Court reversed it. There's not any, I, I will answer you candidly and honestly, I don't know of a path that's going to reverse that. The way the law now is, felons upon release and upon completion of all their probation conditions, that's when they get their right to vote back. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of where it is. about like, um, drug felonies before 1986? Maybe that's just the special benefit, I'm not sure. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I know what the law was, and now what it's reverted back to, and that is you have to meet all the conditions of parole mm -hmm. uh, 
to when you're uh, doing the vote back. I know, thank you for asking that because that's yet another piece of where voting is going to be tougher. 56,000 mm -hmm. people became eligible to vote, cast a ballot after that. We had that brief window. Uh, and you know, again, I'm saying this, trying to say this with nonpartisan uh, hat on, but you know, I know the majority party says, elect, say elections matters. Mm -hmm. They took two of those seats uh, in the state Supreme Court and they've got a bill right now that will raise the retirement age for the current Chief Justice Paul Newby to where they will have control of um, even if Democrats holding the seats now, there's one coming up in 24, I think it's Mike Morgan, Anita Earls is in 26, uh, they'll still have control probably mm -hmm. through the rest of this decade, just because of the way of the staggered elections for that court. Mm -hmm. uh, that's what we are facing, a harsh court that is rubber stamping what the legislature mm -hmm. wants. They've surrendered mm -hmm. their authority and duty of looking at what the legislature does. I mean, and the issue that I also care about, fair maps, they've essentially said to the legislature, you want to engage in partisan gerrymandering, have at it. There are no more limits. Mm -hmm. There are no more boundaries. And you all may remember, this was our thing when we were fighting in court, um, Thomas Hoffler. Anybody ever heard of that name, Hoffler? Uh, the New York Times coined him as the Michael Angelo of gerrymandering. He was a guy behind closed doors that was, you know, the, the drawing and gerrymandering the maps. And when we had 13 congressional districts, uh, you may remember, you know, they drew a map that was 10-3, and it was asked, hey, why did you draw a 10-3 map? And one of the Republicans said, because we couldn't figure out how to make it 11-2. Uh, Hoffler actually had a map that was 12-1, to and that's when we took him to court. But all these things, and because they're going to draw maps, by the way, too. I know that's not part of uh, you know the talk, but it's connected. Either in August or the fall, they get to draw everything: legislature, state house, state senate, and congressional. And they'll have the benefit of the 2022 elections to be even more precise in how they gerrymander. And that's the other big danger. We could have again great voting rights, but most of the congressional and legislative districts will be preordained and will be tilted to entrench yeah. the current party in power. Yeah. So wow, have I depressed everybody? Have you had to kick yourselves off the floor? Of course, of course I have. Uh, so here's what we have to do. We have to get people to vote. That's what it's all about. And I'm saying this again, you know, we want everyone to vote, but we have to get folks voting. It didn't happen, unfortunately, in 2022. But I will say this, and uh, Peter, you can tell me if I'm crossing lines. I am hopeful that people will view what the folks are doing right now on Jones Street as an overreach, and that can be some of the narrative. Mm -hmm. If they've gone too far, mm -hmm. reproductive rights, education, my gosh, millionaires, they can now get public vouchers to send their kids yes. to private schools. Lord, Does that make any I'm sense? Right. Of course not. This is really one of the worst. I think it's worse in this time when they have the supermajorities than it was 10 years ago when they first got it. They didn't know what they were doing then. Now they do, and they're mm -hmm. getting a ton of advice from folks, you know, in um, Washington and out of state. Uh, I could go on and on and on, but I do want to make sure that I am respectful I think of the time. Questions would be good right now. Questions? Is yeah. that what you said? <laughs> yeah. yeah. If you want to accept some questions? Yeah, and I see. Uh, I know you. Uh, I'll ask because I saw you're in first, and then I'll get you. Go ahead. Yeah, so I was managing the largest paid canvas in District 63 and 64 in Alamance County during the term elections. And, Ricky Hurtado. Uh, Is that yeah, right? We lost. Yeah, but you were managing. I was, was managing the down home North Carolina paid okay. canvas. So we had 11,000 conversations. We had 36,000 door knocks. Um, we saw the data. It said um, pretty much people between 60 and up and 40 and up were voting, and nobody else was. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, this, the landscape was pretty stark. Our souls of the polls was very poorly attended. Um, we had 42 people canvassing. You know, we worked super hard. And it seemed to me that, um, I, you know, just number-wise, we need to lean into either Republicans turning or capturing an independent vote, as well as making sure that our people get out and vote. No. So I was wondering if you could give any insight into it. Like, we're we have to prepare now. <laughs> 
Yeah, and you know, you were with Down Home. I was, yeah. Yeah, great organization. Uh, appreciate it. Well, if you are not there now, but I appreciate what, the, what you did and what that organization does. Um, and I will say this, one of the things that we do at Common Cause is we have an outreach to our historically black colleges and universities. I've got four <laughs> colleagues, all HBCU graduates, uh, many of them from North Carolina A&T. Do we have any proud Aggies in the room here? Eagle. Eagle, okay. Central. That's yeah. Carolina. Yeah. Carolina. Yeah. Carolina. Yeah. But I say that, again, <laughs> we, we, we did a lot of work. We, we did a lot of engagement, mm -hmm. and voting was flat there, too. The number one reason why people don't vote is lack of information. Exactly. That's, That's right. And Education. We, we, we put this voter guide, and I was telling one of my colleagues yesterday, for the young people, it's almost like, will you please subscribe to the print edition of the Raleigh News and Observer? Uh -huh. Who does that now? I love the NNO. It's not the paper it was, but I quickly found out when I was subscribing to the print version, picking it up off my driveway and thinking, I read those stories three days ago. Uh -huh. We've got to figure out ways to do it differently and That's better. Exactly. Common cause is no, guilty of all that. We've got to figure out how to do it better. Exactly. And some of it is, you know, and I know you all do what they call deep canvassing where you have those kind of conversations. It's hard to do though. I've knocked on many a door and many times they either don't answer the door, they're not too kind, or then if you say, I'm not selling you anything, and you know, then you can kind of get going on it. Mm -hmm. But we've got to figure out creative ways. Yes. And we're also trying to actually have some real conversations because, oh boy, in Raleigh, you get a bunch of us who work in the good government progressive community, put us all in the same room, we can opine on anything and try to figure out, well, here's why people didn't vote, you know, and this and that and whatever, but we gotta go out and talk to people. Mm -hmm. And outside exactly. of Raleigh, go to Cabarrus County, go to counties that are not in the cool. triangle, rural counties, absolutely. Yeah. So we're trying to do some of that, and I wish I could say I had a nice, neat answer for you. But we all, if we care about this, we all need to figure out what happened and why. Go ahead. Uh, two things. One, yes. what is the basis upon denying college students a vote when they are of age? What would be their basis for doing that? They want to make it harder. I mean, they want to yeah. make it harder. Is it constitutional? What they just, what's their, how could they well, a couple things. I mean, I think there's some people who philosophically mm -hmm. feel that a kid who's from Charlotte or from Concord and goes yeah, to Durham mm -hmm. doesn't have a fundamental constitutional right to vote in the town where they go to college. Yes. No, no, you got to go back home. Mm -hmm. and, that, and that has been litigated, and that is not, I mean, that's, they might try to see yes. if they can re-litigate re that again, but that's one of the things. There's also been some talk about out-of-state kids, and we have lots right. of out-of-state kids who right. come here to say that unless they declare their <laughs> emancipation, i.e. independence mm -hmm. from their parents, mm -hmm. they have no legal basis to also mm -hmm. vote. Mm -hmm. They're really, though, to answer your question, I they aren't know. providing us a legal reason. Mm -hmm. They just want to do everything mm -hmm. they yeah. can to make yeah. it proper yeah. to vote. Mm -hmm. North Carolina A&T has a precinct on campus. Mm -hmm. I know that it's central. There's one in proximity to UNC. I mean, name your favorite campus Duke has some too. I know they yes, have at least one. And, and that's a great thing. We believe that um, you know college campuses should have precincts on election day and if possible in early voting or something near right. it. And so it's really more of in their heads they don't think college kids should vote if they're you know not back in their hometown. They're not really trying to say an 18 year old shouldn't vote. Right. But they're trying to do everything they can to make it harder. That's what, it, that's what it is. Yes. Related to that, isn't, and I missed the very beginning, I'm sorry, isn't there also an issue with ID and like mm -hmm. not accepting college ID mm -hmm. as ID? And I was curious, I hadn't heard you mention that yet, so maybe I missed yeah. it, but I, the whole issue with voter ID. I appreciate you asking that question because we were talking about this on a staff call yesterday, and it's hard. We get so much information about this. And my uh, previous job before working for Lieutenant Governor Wicker was I was actually a reporter. So, you know, I'm always interested in making sure facts and we have it. And I just confirmed uh, the question you're asking with our good friends. You all have heard of the Southern Coalition for Social Justice. Mm -hmm. Anita Rolsinger yeah. founded it, and they were our attorneys and all this. So here's what the case is. They passed, uh, you know, the referendum passed voter ID. And for a while, it was uncertain whether college IDs would work for students. In June of 2019, there was a negotiated bill with Republicans and Democrats that came together and passed a bill, and Governor Cooper signed it into a law that allows, actually, 
public and private college student IDs to be used for voting. That's a good thing. It actually is. Uh, the campuses just have to kind of get pre clear by the State Board of Elections. It's not really a high hurdle for, that, for them to do that. So to answer your question, as we are speaking right now, with voter ID being the law, college IDs are good. The campuses simply have to, again, apply to the State Board of Elections. All 17 public universities, and by November 2019, they had had that pre-clearance. Mm -hmm. I don't know how many of the privates. I know Duke, surely they had it. And you know, they, Duke wouldn't be left behind. I'm kind of having some fun here. Uh, but um, anyway, good question because that's part of the education when you have that young person and we're going to do everything we can to make sure that Cleta Mitchell is not successful in mm -hmm. turning back into these laws but we want to make sure that those college kids know they can use their ID mm -hmm. to get that ballot and vote mm -hmm. so you know lack of information we have one of the longest ballots in America by the way we elect everything can anybody name you know the um, the state auditor, the insurance commissioner, well, probably this audience, I, you know, you could, but when I was, you know, younger or not in this job, I didn't know many of these people. So information is important. Education about yes. who's on the ballot, what the office is, why it matters. Not telling people, we can't tell anyone who to vote for, right, exactly. but at least given the context of what the office is about, as, as well as, you know, here's when early voting starts. Here's where you can go, where the nearest early voting site, all those kind of things, you know, we're all about. Um, 411. What now? 411 League. 411, that's right. Are you with the League? Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, the League obviously is an ally. You do a great job with that voter well, guide. Well, your trusted town hall uh, forums that you had, mm -hmm. have, will they be repeated? Like 101 and 201 that Gino Nuzalilo, the young. The youngster who I work with? You uh, uh, the one we had in Catawba County was with Jennifer Roberts. And oh, okay, yeah, that, that's right. They'll have, so you're from Catawba County. Well, you definitely, you ping me. My, uh, <laughs> my dad grew up at Probe's Crossroads, as you know, <coughs> for a T4 <coughs> you know, in that area. So I have some Catawba County roots, so to speak. I didn't grow up there, though. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Well, a comment about the college. I, I think uh, at base, it's not about these technical uh, issues. They basically want to repress young voters because young voters don't agree with their. That's right. That's, 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 that's the real yeah. fundamental that's thing. That's right. yeah. Yeah. The other thing about Republicans, you know, many have been observing this. Their their long-term strategy is to govern without a majority support. Mm -hmm. That's what gerrymandering is about yeah. too. Right. Is to succeed without the support of a majority of mm -hmm. people. That's the bottom line. And you don't have to be That's partisan to, to, yeah, to, to say something. that. To That's not a partisan you. observation. Right, right. right. Um, what, you need, Bob, what, we, what we need, <laughs> we need a video game. And, and the uh, objective is to get the get to your voting booth. Can you do it? You're That's right. right. You, can you get That's right. That's right. And give them 50 yeah. credits yeah. on the video game. We're not talking about a Pac-Man video game. We're talking about the high tech. Fortnite, right. baby. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. Would you also do a plug for Common Calls participation? Yeah. Oops. Membership, co Common Calls. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, in terms of people who want to find out more about us. How can they become involved in your? Oh yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. That's the point. Yeah. I was hoping you'd make. Yeah, gosh, I'm a little slow here today. I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, and thank you for allowing me to do that. Yeah, we love volunteers. We love to also flex our muscles. Mm -hmm. We are a statewide organization, so part of you, you know, if you contact me, we have many things. What one of the things we're trying to do is monitoring our county board of elections. These are the folks that decide where the early voting sites are, how many they're going to be. Yeah. Um, a lot of the decisions that really affect our voting and so we're trying to make sure that we have eyes on that. I don't know if you all know Surrey County. Anybody know oh, yeah. Surrey yeah. County? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Mount Airy. Yeah. And who's from Mount Airy? Who's our most famous yeah. North Andy Gray. Andy Gray. That's right. Yeah. yeah. Oh, 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 and Opie and <laughs> yeah, Ainge, Ainge would be horrified about the Surrey County Board of Ele County Board of Elections. You all may know this, when the election happened, two of the Republican Surrey County Board of Election Commissioners, they refused to sign off no. of the election, just said, no, no, it was corrupt, it was fraudulent, we're not mm. going to sign it. And we had a person there in the meeting, there was no reporter, in um, Dobson, Surrey County, which is below Mount Airy, he saw it, 
and he asked for the paperwork that showed what these people, they had this awful letter talking about how terrible the election was in North Carolina. And we exposed it. The State Board of Elections had a hearing, um, I don't know, last month, and they kicked these two guys off mm -hmm. properly. So, and I just say that example because that's the kind of stuff that if we aren't in the room to see it, you know, lots of that stuff can happen. And so that's one of the ways we can volunteer. So I would just say, you know, comicallsnc.org, look for us uh, as George and Domeno and Pete. And Peter, you would know this too. When I started at Common Cause back in 2001, it was me. I was a one-man band. That was it. All, you know, everything. And uh, Peter, maybe that's why you left, because you said, this guy, <laughs> he's not going to be able to do much. I was much. so happy you arrived. Thank God I can go. <laughs> and I know it's all relative. Uh, our friends at Democracy North Carolina and SCSJ, I mean, they have wonderful staff, talented folks. But we're now up to a dozen people. We're bigger than we've ever been. And many of you all, I should thank, because you have supported us. And we do appreciate that. So we're always welcoming your support. I'm sorry, I'm talking. I'm not filibustering. I'm brought. I got the 10 minutes. I got the 10 minutes time. Yes, sir. Um, I think this will go to voting rights down the road, but I'm concerned about where we are in North Carolina with Article 5. And can you oh, speak yeah. to that? Yeah, because wow. if that wins um, across the nation, yeah. I think voting rights will be the first thing they attack. People know what Article 5 is, you know, this constitutional convention. convention. And, and what we do have, and you may know this, there are three resolutions that have been passed by the House. Speaker Tim Moore has one of them. And they can actually be um, kind of... Uh, oriented, Moore's is on voting, uh, no, term limits, that's what his is. The pure constitutional convention is, to your point, you bring in, if three-fifths of the states <clears throat> pass this kind of thing, you have a convention and they can change the constitution. There are no rules about it. I mean, there's a lot of unknowns and uncertainties. It's a real danger. You need 34 states to get it done. 28 have so far passed uh, a resolution for a constitutional convention. We don't want North Carolina to become the 29th. The House has passed it. In recent years, it's been kind of odd. One year the House passed it, the Senate didn't. Another year the Senate passed it and the House didn't. I have talked to the rules chair. Anybody from Brunswick County? No. Um, the rules chair is a guy named Bill Rabin, uh, who is a Republican. He is against the constitutional convention, and I'm saying I know you guys are going to vote on it, but I'm hoping you can kind of stop this train from happening in the Senate. We do not want uh, Article 5 to be adopted in North Carolina. It's out there. I don't know what they're going to do. I don't know if the leadership wants it. In that Tim Moore, though, has one of the Article 5 resolutions, and again, it's tied only to term limits, and only six states have adopted that particular resolution. So if we begin the seventh, it's not good, but it's not as bad as that, you know, the one that's more of a broad constitutional convention and we would be the 29th. Because he's the speaker <clears throat> and he's probably running for Congress, that's the, you know, unkept secret in the building. Um, the thought is they may give him that or they'll trade something for that. Anyway, I'm getting away into the weeds of the legislature. Um, but uh, thank you for asking that. Any other? Yes, ma'am. Um, so just think about what we can do right now in our own home counties. I understand. Is, isn't it true that the county commissioners actually are doing the funding for the polling for the, stations? For the uh, for county board of elections. Yeah. Do. So do. yeah. does it make sense to go this June, you know, go show up at your county commissions and see what they're doing with them, like follow the money? The budgets are being formulated even yes. as we speak. As and so it's not a bad thing to do that. It's also what I would suggest if you all want to do that is connect with the local uh, county board of um, commission member. If you're a Republican, you know, ask the Republican who's on the board. If you're a Democrat or an unaffiliated, you know, ask the Democrat and say, what are your needs? Are you all properly funded? What are you hearing that your local county commissioners in their budget are providing? Is there any room? Some counties have already made that decision, but that's a very good point. And sign up to be a speaker. Yeah, Press definitely. Write your letter to the editor afterwards. Yeah. Like, make it public so yeah. people know exactly what's happening behind the smoke screens. These are public meetings in the pandemic era. They were often online where mm -hmm. people could watch it from the comfort of their own. Mm -hmm. Now many of them have stopped that. But to your point, if people can make that commitment and physically go cover, uh, go attend those meetings and speak out, uh, that's a, certainly a good thing. 
Um, yes. I was going to say, um, the last two elections, I volunteered as a poll as a poll observer mm -hmm. and a poll chaplain, uh -huh. um, which was a, a newer program I wasn't familiar with until recently, and just wanted to say if, if any of you are looking for ways to get involved in a nonpartisan way, that I don't know if you all work with that at all, but it, I, I were you on the outside or inside? Outside. Yeah, that would yeah. do that, and I think that's great. And we, it was a really great experience. Yeah. Um, the two, the last two elections when I done it. We, uh, one of the things we do, and I mentioned the um, uh, program, I'm just going to lean here against the wall. In my advanced years, you know, I kind of find this help sometimes as I get a little tired. <laughs> Five minutes, so uh, we're getting close. <laughs> one of the things we do, though, to your, po to your point, is um, we recruit the kids from the HBCU campuses mm -hmm. and train them to be poll monitors, and they help us protect the vote. And they are trained to, t if they see a problem, to call the hotline, mm -hmm. as you probably knew to do. Uh, and just kind of be, yeah, that's right, to be the eyes and, eyes and ears.